Hi, today we're going to be playing around with my super tiny MS-DOS gaming PC, which I've called the Wii C. If you haven't seen part one of this video, then you might want to take a look at that first, but just to recap, the Wii C is based around this industrial processor module from iCOP, which has an x86 compatible processor that can run MS-DOS natively with no emulation. To that, I added a Sound Blaster compatible audio output using a chip from Crystal Semiconductor, as well as a snazzy little case to keep everything safe. I was very pleased with the first Wii C revision, but one issue really bothered me, and that's the lack of a MIDI wavetable synth, giving it much worse music quality in a lot of games. So today we're going to fix that, as well as try out a few different games and see how they perform. Now before we go on, I just want to address the shut up and take my money issue. A lot of people have told me that I should build and sell these things, and I would love to find some way of getting them into more people's hands, but I'm very happy at my day job and I just don't have time to start my own business. If someone wants to put the work into polishing up the design and overseeing manufacture and distribution, then I'd be more than happy to work with them, but it's definitely not something I'm interested in doing myself. Anyway, the reason the first Wii C prototype didn't have a MIDI wavetable synth is because I didn't think it would be possible to fit a Wave Blaster board in the case alongside the processor module and carrier board. However, I recently noticed that the Dream Blaster S2 synth by Serdico can just fit in above the VGA connector, so I added a Wave Blaster header to the carrier board in that exact place and hooked it up to the sound chip. This new revision of the board, version 0.3, is the first one I'm going to release publicly. It could use a few cleanups and optimizations, but it works perfectly well for now. So let's order it from the sponsor of this video, PCBWay. I've uploaded the board design files to PCBWay's shared projects section, so ordering it is extremely easy. I'll give you a link to the page below. New users get $5 off their first order, and you can get assembly services for as little as $20 if you can't handle fine pitch surface mount soldering yourself. The quality of the boards I've received has always been excellent, and they also now offer very reasonably priced low volume CNC machining and 3D printing services. While the boards are being made, we need to order the components. The most important one is, of course, the processor module. Now, as it's an industrial component, you'll need to buy it from a specialist supplier of industrial computers. I can recommend Datasound Laboratories in the UK, as they've always been very helpful to me. Ask them to sell you the appropriate header connectors and mounting hardware, as they can be a little hard to source otherwise. I bought most of the rest of my components from Mauser. Optionally, you can add a wavetable MIDI synth. Unfortunately, the Dream Blaster X2 won't fit, but the S2 or McFly will, so grab one of them from Serda Shop. The total cost of the components is about £250 or $350, so it's not a super cheap project, but I guess it's in the same ballpark as premium mini consoles from companies like Analog. Mind you, you don't have to build them yourself, but anyway. Now the boards have arrived from PCBWay, let's get assembling. I'll start with the processor module headers, which are a little easier to solder on this board revision thanks to the locating holes being present. Next, I would normally recommend adding the power supply, SD card and VGA components so you can test the processor module is booting before you move on to anything else, but I'm just going to YOLO it and start adding the sound card components. I normally add the sound chip in the centre first as it can be hard to get to later, then I work my way down the bill of materials, adding all the surface mount components of a specific type before moving on to the next type. Then once all the surface mount stuff is done, I come back and get all the through hole components. Now, you might be wondering why I left a cutout down either side of the micro USB connector. This is because micro USB connectors are really intended to be reinforced by the device's enclosure. This stops them being torn off the board if the USB cable is yanked a bit too hard. Since that isn't really possible here, the cutouts are designed to allow you to put a zip tie around the entire connector, which will hopefully strengthen it a bit. I've used this approach on a few boards now, but I have no idea if it actually helps. Still, it makes me feel more secure and that's all that matters. Final step is to insert the board into the enclosure and screw on the end plates. Doesn't that look neat? Now we have it assembled, it's time to test it. Turn it on, and if you get boot messages, then great! If not, check your soldering. Note that previously, I used to recommend programming the EEPROM before soldering by using an external ROM programmer, but for most people it's probably easier to just use the flashing tools provided by the Orpheus sound card, which uses the same crystal chip as the Wii C. You will, however, have to edit csmpu330.ini to enable adlib support. You just add the text IFM to the global config bits field. Also, you should change the name of the device from Orpheus to, for example, WC. This will stop certain drivers detecting it as an Orpheus and disabling adlib again. Next thing to do is get an operating system on it. Ironically, I find Windows 98 to be a really good choice for a fast MS-DOS gaming PC, as it has support for large partitions as well as tools to make running fussy games easier. I'll go into more details about that later. 
There's a couple of different ways to get Windows 98 onto this PC, but I'll show you the method I use. First, you use a program like Rufus or Etcher to write a Windows 98 boot floppy image to a USB stick. Next, format an SD card as FAT32 and copy the contents of the Windows 98 CD to a folder in it. Connect both the SD card and the USB stick to the PC and fire it up. It should boot from the USB stick, then you select Start Computer without CD-ROM support. Then just launch the Windows 98 setup from the C drive by changing to the folder you copied the CD to and typing Setup. You'll notice that drivers for the sound chip are included with Windows 98, but I recommend installing the official drivers as Windows doesn't include DOS drivers. Also, it lets you disable the horrible 3D audio feature that makes everything sound like it's underwater. You should also probably install graphics, network, and USB drivers. I'll give you a link to everything in the video description. Now, let's put some games on it. The quickest option is probably to copy them directly to the SD card, but you should shut down the WC before you do that. You can also transfer files over USB or even by network. Windows 98 is still happy to share files with modern computers. Check below for a guide on how to do this. In terms of where to get games from, there are a fair few DOS games on GOG and Steam, and you can often find original discs and CDs on eBay or what have you. It isn't very easy to connect a CD drive to the WC, but there are CD drive emulators available for DOS. I'll link you to one below. It can often take a lot of fiddling to get games to work, but unfortunately that's true of all DOS PCs, and Windows 98 actually makes it a bit easier for you. If you create a shortcut to the game's executable, you can make it start up in MS-DOS mode. This lets you specify a custom autoexec.bat and config.sys, so you can dial in the settings you want exactly. You'll see the sound card drivers are already there, but you might want to add mouse drivers or different memory modes. I'll link you to a few guides on how to customise DOS startup files below. Sound card settings are probably the most complex part of DOS game setup. The earliest DOS games used the PC beeper, which in this case is routed to the mono channel of the sound chip, so it gets mixed into the main audio output. You might need to adjust the volume using the CWB mix command, which is installed as part of the sound card drivers. For later games, the sound chip in the Wii C pretends to be a Sound Blaster Pro at address 220, IRQ5, DMA1. The chip also emulates ad-lib music, which is also used by some early games for sound effects. If you want better quality music out of some games, then you'll have to add a MIDI synthesizer. We've already covered the Dream Blaster S2, which fits inside the Wii C and I think sounds perfectly fine, but it doesn't support MT32 games, and some instruments sound pretty tinny. If you really want the best game music, you'll have to connect an external synth via an adapter to the joystick port. But thanks to the MT32 Pi project, it's really easy to build a tiny external synth that gives you both MT32 and general MIDI support. You can even connect a little screen to it to simulate the screen on the MT32, which some games will display text on to add extra jokes and whatnot to the game experience. There's even a DOS utility to switch it between MT32 and general MIDI mode. It's a super cool project, and I'll give you a link to it below. Note that for some games you might need to run an extra driver called Soft MPU. Again, I'll give you a link to that below. Okay, now we've finally got everything set up, let's test some games. Let's start with some that have really good MIDI soundtracks. As a big jazz fan, I'll of course start with Transport Tycoon, which features some amazing compositions by John Broomhall. I'd only ever heard the general MIDI versions before, but the AdLib and MT32 arrangements are actually really great too. The tracks Snarl Up and Little Red Diesel are two particular standouts, but there are over 20 tracks ranging from Ragtime all the way up to Jazz Fusion. And if you haven't heard the live versions from the 2014 re-release of the game, then you really must. Also, laying out train tracks is a really good way to practice PCB design. Moving on, another game with a wonderful albeit short soundtrack is Theme Hospital, whose soundtrack is composed by Russell Shaw amongst others, and perfectly suits the comedic tone of the game without being silly, apart from maybe the track Candy Floss. I'd also like to nominate the track Sixes and Sevens for the funkiest MIDI bassline of all time award. The Doom soundtrack by Bobby Prince is of course known for music that sounds suspiciously similar to well-known thrash metal tracks, and the first level especially is perhaps the best known MIDI tune of all time. But it also gives us a chance to test another feature of the Wii C that we haven't really examined till now, network gaming. I'll link you to the full DOS drivers for the network port below. The ones you want for DOS gaming are the ODI drivers, and once started you can set up a network game between two computers by using the setup utility. I connected the Wii C to my slightly larger DOS gaming PC I built in a previous video and set them up in my living room. Then I invited my mate Jamie round for a deathmatch. Bastard! Doom is still a massively fun game to play multiplayer, and really stood the test of time in a way that many other first-person shooters from around the same time never quite did. You can of course play network games on Windows too, so this makes a great little StarCraft machine if you like that kind of thing. 
Until now, I've been mainly playing 90s PC games, as this was the era of DOS gaming I was around for, but it's perfectly capable of playing older games like Alley Cat, Test Drive, California Games, etc. Some games might require you to throttle the processor using the BIOS. In there, you can disable level 1 and level 2 cache and slow down the CPU clock by up to 32 times. The BIOS settings will only last until the next time the WC is switched off, but if you want to be able to save them, you can bodge on a 3V lithium cell battery. I soldered some wires to a PCB mount cell, but I believe you can also buy cells that have the wires already attached. The positive terminal of the cell goes to this pin, and the negative terminal goes to any ground pin. I used this one. Then I just sort of stashed my cell between the processor module and the connectors. Not the most elegant solution, but it works for now. Perhaps in a future revision I'll add proper pads to support a battery. So, that's about it for the Wii C for now, but I know what you're all thinking. Can we build an even smaller DOS gaming PC? Well, possibly. You see, iCorp also manufactures an even smaller x86 module called the SOM128EX, which is used in the 86 Duino platform. Using this module, it should be possible to cut the length down by about a third, and possibly even more if we sacrifice some of the bulkier external connectors. Now, it isn't ideal, it doesn't have any graphics hardware so you have to add a PCI Express video card, and also its ISA bus is a little strange, as it multiplexes the pins with a load of other peripherals, so Sound Blaster support might be tricky. I'll do some experimentation at some point, but I'm sick to death of building tiny DOS gaming PCs, so I'm gonna move on to some other projects before possibly revisiting this again a little later. Anyway, thanks very much for watching. If you like this project, please subscribe and hit the notification button because I have some really cool retro computing and DJ tech stuff coming up soon. Catch you later.